Welcome to the fourth and final part of our rotary engine build presented by Valvoline. As you guys just saw, we bolted everything up on the front side of the motor, including that water housing and pulleys. And we are moving to the back side of the motor now where you can see we've already torqued down our spec flywheel. This is an aluminum flywheel. And as you can see, it's got a removable mating surface here, which is really nice if you ever run into a problem where you, you know, burn the surface or otherwise score and damage it. You can just replace the mating surface rather than having to replace the whole thing. So that's a nice cost saving measure. These are also machined to one one thousandth of a tolerance. So they're very accurate. They're really well balanced. You'll even notice there's a paint mark on here to balance it with the pressure plate that I'll show you in a moment. Oh, by the way, weight wise, the stock flywheel, you can see is a big beefy boy. It weighs 20 pounds. This weighs about half that. So we'll say around 10 pounds. We didn't weigh it, but we know from experience using these aluminum flywheels from spec that, that typically they weigh half of, of the stock flywheel. And for friction material, we have gone with specs stage two plus kit which we've run on a bunch of our project cars before. And as you can see, it's got Kevlar on one side for that nice drivability and streetability. And on the other side, it's got this carbon semi-metallic, which gives it higher torque capacity. So it's about 15 to 20% higher than their stage two, which has Kevlar on both sides. So this guy's rated for 425 foot pounds, which is plenty for a rotary. Even if we push this motor really hard, typically these motors don't make a ton of torque. So this should be able to hold as much power as we ever plan to make with this motor. So I think we'll be good because we'll have nice streetability and all the torque capacity we need. So it'll make for a really nice street track setup. Now that we've got the clutch and flywheel in place, we are moving on to installing the intake manifolds. And yes, I used the plural form there because there are basically two parts of the intake manifold. But before we install that, we actually need to plug these two holes here, you can see we've plugged one already. And these are for the oil metering pump system. So that normally there's a fitting in there that helps feed oil in to inject oil to the apex seals. We'll go uh, into more detail on that a little bit later, but for now we just want to plug these up. You can also see that we've put the, the OE crush washer in place there. I think that'll help make it, you know, make a good seal there. Here we have our primary fuel rail. This is off the old motor. And as you can see, it's seen better days. This seat is completely trashed. And these injectors are 25 years old and it's got a tiny little uh, non-adjustable fuel pressure reg regulator on here. So we are deleting all this and going with the good stuff, starting with some primary injectors from Deechworks. These are their 950 cc units that are designed to be a direct fit in the FD. We've dropped our radium auto.com fuel injector seats in the hole here. They're O-ringed and are like a press fit in there. That probably tips you off to what our rail is going to be. but. Here you can see we've dropped one injector in there already and we've just put a little bit of lube on here and I should mention that these are a Bosch based injector that uh, Deechworks dynamically flow tests to make sure that they are all matched pairs or matched sets so that you get the most accurate fueling you can get. Here we've got our radium engineering primary fuel rail and as you'd expect it is beautifully constructed out of billet aluminum. All their stuff is so nicely designed. I'm always impressed by their product and as you can see it comes with these uh, spacers so that the fuel rail sits at the right height. So I'll just drop this on here now. To complete our primary fuel rail setup here, we are just fitting up these uh, really cool new swivel banjo style AN fittings from Radium. I think this is a new offering in their lineup and look at how cleanly it's gonna allow us to route the fuel lines. It's really like tucked in nice and tight. Normally they come off straight and you have to make a big loop where this way we can route them any way we want. And once it's tightened down, you can swivel this fitting either direction. So it's gonna give us a lot of flexibility 
before we get to the rest of our fuel system, we are going to install our excessive manufacturing lower intake manifold. It's this really nice cast aluminum piece that they make. And as you can see side by side with the factory piece here, there are some important differences. Most notably, it deletes this ACV or air control valve unit up here, uh, which gets rid of a lot of the vacuum lines and that whole rat's nest that you have to deal with normally. And uh, you can also see that it's routing of the two interior or primary ports is very different. So you've got these two big uh, primaries here and you can see over here on the stock one, they're much smaller and run a more convoluted path. So that's more restrictive. And it also struggles a bit with balancing airflow to each uh, port. So this does a great job of balancing out airflow, which is important at high uh, horsepower levels. And just bolting it straight up, it flows 20% better than the stock lower intake manifold. And being a really heavy duty cast piece, it has really thick walls. So it gives you a lot of options. If you're doing a lot of aggressive porting, you can port match this, where on this uh, OE unit, the walls are much thinner, so you can't do as much porting. So there you have it, our excessive lower intake manifold is bolted in place and you'll notice that we have blocked the two inner ports here with the provided plugs. And that's because we don't want to run a single fuel rail setup. We're sticking with a primary and secondary rail setup like the OE uh, design uses. But this does accommodate converting to a single rail if you want to do that. So that is a way to simplify your fuel system setup. But there are apparently some drawbacks to that. Most uh, tuners complain that with a single rail it is harder to tune idle and tip in versus the primary and secondary rail setup. So that's why we've decided to stick with the two rail system because we're going to street drive, street drive our car. So we really want to have that nice idle and tip in behavior. So uh, we are now moving on to installing the secondary fuel injectors, which are of course also from Teachworks. These are a 2200 CC injector. These are the big boys because the secondaries are really what flow all that fuel. When you start to get in a boost, these guys kick in and will give you enough fuel for this thirsty motor and if you know anything about rotaries you do know they're thirsty so you gotta have enough injector just installed our radium engineering secondary fuel rail and it's worth pointing out by the way that we were planning to install this fuel pressure sensor on the underside of the secondary rail it has a port to accommodate that or a say a pulse damper but we realized with that hanging down in there routing the wiring to it would be very difficult so we swapped that over to the primary rail and just like the primary rail, you can see we have these phenolic spacers here as well as washers under the bolt heads. And that is to separate the heat from the motor from the fuel. It's especially important, I think, on the primary rail where it's sitting right on the very hot iron section. Now that we've got both our fuel rails in place, we whipped up this fuel line using Vibrant Performance parts to show you how the routing of the system is going to work. So this uses Vibrant Performance's uh, flexible race hose in a dash six size. And these, of course, are Vibrant's dash six and fittings on either end. So we're gonna bring the fuel feed into this side of the primary rail and then feed it out from the primary from here and connect it to the secondary rail over here. If I can get that threaded on there, I can give you a quick demonstration how that's gonna look. And that is how the two rails are connected in series, just like the OE system is. You can choose to run them in parallel if you prefer, but we think this is the more elegant way to go. I should mention, however, Vibrant does have an option where we could have used their PTF E-lined hose. So they offer this PTF hose either wrapped in a stainless braid or a black nylon braid like this. And it's much smaller in diameter. This is actually a dash eight hose. And as you can see, it's actually a bit smaller than the dash six flexible race hose. So if this was a six, it, it'd be like almost half the size. However, because it's got this hard P PTF E-liner, it's not nearly as flexible. So you can't bend it in tight, as tight a radius. So to make this kind of lineup, we felt we needed the flexibility of their regular flex hose. So that's what we're going with that setup. With all that said, I think it's also worth mentioning that this fuel system is maybe best described as original. Ding, 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 ding! That handsome man with the beard just said the word original, which means it's time for another Valvoline original motor oil moment. That's right, Dave. Valvoline is the original motor oil and they've been reinventing it ever since. From the world's first high mileage oil to the world's first synthetic blend. You got that right, Peter, and Valvoline is better than ever. It's nearly reformulated advanced full synthetic offering up to 10 times better protection against heat buildup than industry standards. Well, there you have it, folks. Now let's get back to the rotary engine building action. Woo! 
just finished bolting on the upper intake manifold and throttle body. These are the OE pieces. There are a bunch of options you can go with up here, but you kind of get into diminishing returns with this stuff. So we're just sticking with the stock stuff because it's going to get us to our power, desired power levels. And by the way, everyone, look under here. All the room for activities under here now. We used to have coil packs and vacuum lines and all kinds of junk under there. And now it's nice and clean. So it gives us some options to put some things under there if we want or just leave it looking the way it does. And by the way, you'll also notice it's really nice cast aluminum oil filler net from excessive manufacturing. We've gone with this because their lower intake manifold actually changes the position of the upper intake manifold slightly and it does interfere with the plastic piece. You can apparently clearance the plastic piece if you want or you can just upgrade to this much nicer more heavy duty filler neck uh, like we have and I think it just gives the motor a really nice look. Here's the black plastic OE intake uh, elbow and here is our Gretti cast aluminum intake elbow and you can see there's quite a difference in the way they radius in toward the uh, throttle body side. It's a much more gradual radius here on the Gretti one versus the stock one makes a much sharper bend. And I don't know how durable these plastic ones are if they tend to break, but obviously this nice cast piece will never have any durability issues with. And I believe it will flow quite a bit better. And it might also tip you off to what we're going to do as far as like uh, a front mount intercooler setup and things like that. So. That stuff may in fact say Gretti on it. You'll have to stay tuned for that build series to find out. Moving on to the hot side, we are actually gonna be using Turblown Engineering's full turbo kit, and we are gonna install part of that today, starting with this beautiful cast uh, exhaust manifold. This is actually an investment cast piece made of 347 stainless steel instead of the usual 304 stainless that you would get in a, say, a fabricated manifold. And the 347 handles high heat much better than the 304. And the way this is investment cast, you can also see it has very smooth flowing runners, which actually taper slightly towards this T4 flange. And what that does is it speeds exhaust flow and actually helps with boost response. Uh, you can also see that these uh, flanges here were CNC machined to be perfectly flat. So unlike you know a lot of other headers that might be run on a belt sander to flatten them out, these are CNC'd for uh, true precision and you know the best seal possible. You can also see it has bungs on the bottom side here for EGT probes or for uh, exhaust back pressure sensors. So we will bolt this guy on here right now and move on to showing you our spoolie boy. And here we have our turbocharger. This will be making all of the boost and this is a Borg Warner internally wastegated EFR 7670. And I should mention that this manifold is designed specifically to work with an internally wastegated EFR like this one. We went with the 7670, which is one of their more compact, one of their smaller turbos. I think they call it their B2 frame turbo because we wanted a really responsive, quick spooling setup with this high compression motor where we're running those RX-8 rotors. We're gonna be spinning this motor to a lot of RPM. We really wanted something that isn't about making huge top end numbers, but might be on a little on the laggy side. We wanted something that was gonna spool up really fast, give us great throttle response, and be a really nice street setup, but still be able to make big enough power that we can go to the racetrack and beat up on a lot of uh, big dollar cars if we want to. One upgrade to this turbocharger unit that Elliot from TurboSource and Turbolone Engineering recommended was this Gen 5 Turbo Smart actuator for the internal wastegate. You can see the factory unit is here and uh, it's physically smaller and you can see it's also got a single port where this is a true two port and that two port gives you a much broader window of uh, boost control. It's also got this collar system here, which allows you to change out the internal spring from five PSI up to 26 PSI. And uh, I should also mention that it has a, a larger internal uh, surface area to that diaphragm, which gives you better boost control. So all in all, this is gonna just make tuning it that much more accurate, that much more easier for our tuner. So that is our upgrade there. We're also going to make an upgrade to this internal uh, blow off valve. Turbo Smart also makes that. So you will see that in uh, the build series. There you have it everyone, our long block is complete and we think it's a, a very realistic package. We think this is a, an engine that really anyone could aspire to putting in their FDRX7. We were tempted initially to maybe put a 20B in there but the costs are astronomical on something like that. So this engine build, you know, didn't use anything crazy. We did obviously get a little bit creative using those uh, lighter RX8 rotors which are also higher compression. They're 10 to 1 compression rather than a 9 to 1 compression. We've also fully balanced the rotating assembly as well as you saw earlier, the flywheel and clutch are also balanced. So this thing really is capable of spinning 10,000 RPM. Whether or not it will be spun that high will really just depend on the power band that we see from the turbo and whether it's gonna you know, run out of steam at, at those higher RPM numbers. But the, the engine itself is certainly capable of making or spinning reliably to those RPM levels. Keep in mind, of course, that 
when the rotor is only spinning 3,500 RPM, the crank's gonna be spinning over 10,000 RPM. So these engines can spin that high because of that, that magical rotary you know, conversion ratio of rotor speed to uh, crankshaft speed. And I think this is really a, gonna be a great street motor, something that's gonna be really responsive and I hope very reliable for us. Before we go, I do wanna to touch on the, the topic of oil not just because Valvoline is a sponsor of this series, but because we saw in the last couple of episodes there were a bunch of, top, a bunch of comments about oil and how the whole oiling system is going to work and what kind of oil you should run in a rotary engine. It's a, it's a hotly debated topic on the internet, but let me explain to you what we're going to be doing based on the advice of Joe, our, our engine builder, as well as having talked with Valvoline about uh, what's best for this application. So we are going to run this uh, Valvoline Racing Synthetic in a 20W50 weight. I think in a previous episode, I may have said we were gonna run it at a 40 weight by cutting it with some 30 weight racing uh, VR1 oil, which we do have here. But having talked it over with Joe today, he feels that a 50 weight is actually very appropriate for this engine because we're using the Mazda Speed main bearings, which actually have more clearance in them than the stock bearings do. And with more clearance, you want to actually run a heavier weight oil. So this I think will be very appropriate for that. And because these, run, these motors run extremely hot, running a heavier oil is actually a good thing too, because it's gonna be less likely to thin with heat. So it's always gonna give us very good protection. And because we've eliminated the oil metering pump, we will not be injecting this into the combustion chamber to lubricate the apex seals, which is really kind of the contentious issue with rotary engines is, wait a minute, the oil in your sump's also being injected into the combustion chamber and you need to use an oil that's appropriate for that application. And because we're separating those two things out, we are going to pre-mix the fuel with a Valvoline uh, two-stroke oil, which will lubricate those seals. And then that type of oil is designed to be burned off in combustion chambers without carboning up. So we get the best of both worlds. We get the right oil on the apex seals, and we get the right oil in the sump to, to protect the bearings and to keep this thing running reliably, even at the very high heat and high boost pressures that we're going to run through it. If this was strictly a street car though, and we weren't gonna take it to the track, we could certainly go with a more street-oriented oil, like this advanced full synthetic or high mileage full synthetic, both of which have been recently reformulated. In fact, uh, their reformulation is so good that it absolutely blows the industry standards out of the water. The high mileage version is, offers 50% better wear protection, the advanced offers 40% better wear protection, and they both offer 25% better uh, deposit protection versus those industry standards. So incredibly high quality stuff that we would certainly happily run in this motor or any of the other engines that we have here in the shop. Well, Peter, what do you think of your very first rotary building experience? Well, Dave, I think this one was a bit above my pay grade, to tell you the truth. Well, I did have one rotary experience before and to be honest, it didn't end that well, everyone, but let's hope this one goes better. Uh, it, something doesn't look quite right here, Peter. Uh, have you noticed lately? Um... I'm starting to look like I might have a little bit of gray hair in my beard. What's no, going on no, here? no. I think that's just the lens. We got a problem here. Actually, guys, I got one more question for you. This is a serious one. Why don't we just put an LS into the FD? I mean, all this spinning triangles and separate fuel rails and double oil systems, it's all very confusing to me. Just put eight cylinders there and make some real power. What do you think? 